Hello world, it's Craig. This project is a big one, and by big I mean it's 80 feet long, about 10 feet wide, and weighs 180,000 pounds. So this isn't going to be an old-timey electronics project like we usually do. In fact, when this car was built in 1910, that's only a couple of years after the triode vacuum tube was invented. This car is nearly as old as the Model T, and it predates the Titanic. So this is a big project, but in fact, it's not even my project. This is not my car, as my niece says, not my monkeys, not my circus. The car belongs to my brother, Curtis. He picked it up out of a scrapyard more than 40 years ago, and he has been working on restoring and maintaining it ever since. I'm only a worker bee that helps out when I'm in town. I'm not an expert on this car or railroad things in general, so if I say something wrong, please just correct me and try not to get too bent out of shape. We did this project several months ago. I'm just now getting around to putting the video up. This is a 1910 Pullman Railroad car that was an executive car for the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. For the rolling stock people, it was the Denver and Rio Grande 101. If people are interested, we can do a video tour of the car and get more into its history, but these videos are just about the current project, which is changing out a couple of the wheel sets. While the car's from 1910, the trucks are newer. When my brother got the car in 83, he changed out the trucks, or bogies, for these 1945 trucks. Now these are two-piece trucks where the bolster is one casting and everything else is a second casting. In 1910, they just couldn't make castings as large as these trucks needed to be, so they were assembled from parts. It's more like the three-part freight car trucks they use today where the frames, the side frames and the bolsters are separate pieces. Except on the original set, they were like made up from a dozen pieces. And this is what these trucks looked like on the car, and here they're being removed when he installed these old army trucks. So these army trucks are on it now were made for hospital cars during World War II, but the war ended before the cars were actually put into service. So the trucks were 40 years old when he got them, but they were essentially unused. This end of the car has the hand brake, so it's the B end, the brake end. And the other end is the A end, which is where the kitchen is, and that's the ones that need the new wheel sets. If we look at the bearings, the middle set's noticeably different because they're oil bath roller bearings, where the two on the ends are greased bearings. All of these are newer than the old friction bearings that were phased out from the 60s to the 90s. Those had the little door on the end of the journal box. As an example, here's another Pullman car down in Astoria, Oregon, that's sitting on the side of the road. It has the three-axle trucks too, but these are the old-style journals with the door on the end. And here you can see the bearings inside the journal box. So there's three problems with these oil bearings in this middle axle. The first is that the oil is getting really hard to come by, and there isn't a certified replacement. Second, they have to be checked every 30 days, so they're a higher maintenance item. But the biggest problem is that they're now frowned upon by the railroad, and this particular bearing got hot during a move. It wasn't hot enough to trip a hot box detector, but it was hot enough to change the color indicating label on the bearing. So even if he could still get the oil, and the railroad accepted oil bath bearings, this set is still a problem. And for all these reasons, the middle set, which is the only oil bath set on, and the oldest uh, set on the whole car has got to be replaced. And then there's these wheels on the right. The bearings are okay and the wheels are okay, but they're the higher mileage wheels and they're getting near their minimums. So this wheel set's coming off and it's going to be kept as a spare in case something happens to one of the others and the car needs a replacement on short notice. So while the middle set is just going to the boneyard, this right set's eventually going to get put in a cabinet under the car and carried as a spare. You usually don't think of railroad cars carrying spare tires, but as we'll see in a bit, these aren't your standard wheels that are readily available at any railroad yard. And finally, this set on the left has got plenty of wear and the bearings are good. But because it's worn down over the years, it's going to be smaller than the new wheels. And that means it needs to be moved into the center. So it's going to become the middle wheel sets of these trucks where the new ones are put on the two ends. Here are the two new wheel sets. You can see they're just modern, permanently sealed, tapered roller bearings. These new wheel sets are obviously standard gauge, but the trucks on the car don't hold the bearing in the same location as modern trucks. These forks are closer together. And so these trucks need to have each bearing a half an inch closer to the center than normal. So when they made these wheel sets, the axles needed to be turned down and then each bearing pressed a half inch closer. And that's what I meant Earlier, when I said he wants to carry a spare, if the car is kicked onto a siding because of a wheel or a bearing problem, you can't just get a new set off the rack. Now, each of these wheel sets is 3,700 pounds, and the whole truck 
runs about 30,000 pounds or 13,600 kilograms to our metric friends. What we had to do for this wheel change is first disconnect everything from this truck, then install Caribbean under the chassis, and then we lifted up this A into the car, rolled the truck set out, and set the car back down on the cribbing, then swap out the axles, check everything over. When everything's ready, we pick the car back up, roll the trucks under, and then we reconnected everything. Now there's relatively little holding trucks on the car other than goodwill and gravity. To keep the car centered in the truck, the truck bolster, which is the part that actually holds the car up, has a center bowl on the top that the car sits in. And when Kurt installed these trucks, he then added a threaded pin to the center of that bowl. Before that, there was just these little chains that kept the trucks from wandering too far away if the car derails. And modern freight cars don't even have anything holding their trucks on. So it has an inch or an inch and a quarter, inch and a half bolt, and it has a nut on the bottom. Here's a picture of that nut. It's got a tail on it when you put it in, so it's captive and it can't spin around. So the head of the bolt is under the kitchen sink. Getting it off is relatively easy. We just unscrew the bolt and the nut holds itself. Then getting it back in, it really wasn't much harder except my knees had to crawl under there and hold up the nut while the threads were started. Now this is the A end of the car, so the handbrake is down at the platform end, the B end. Originally all six axles were on the handbrake because all six axles were on the same brake system, same brake cylinder. But now each truck has its own pair of brake cylinders and only the B end trucks are on the handbrake. So that means there isn't a brake rod or a chain from the chassis to the truck that we had to disconnect on this end. As we'll see in a bit, the whole braking mechanism is just attached to the truck. The only thing that had to be disconnected was the air line between the car and the truck. Now here you can see Danny's taking these plates off the bottom of the forks. Under each bearing, there are these frame plates and they're secured by a couple of bolts. And these bolts, or these plates keep the axle from falling out of the truck fork if there's a derail. And some trucks have nothing, some have frame keys. This one had full plates. So as far as the lift, the whole car weighs 180,000 pounds, and that's fairly evenly distributed, so 90,000 pounds on each end. But of that 90,000 pounds, the trucks and wheels are 30,000 pounds, which means we really only need to lift 60,000 pounds or 30 tons. Now, fortunately, we were able to borrow this nice shop that's got a 45-ton gantry crane. Now, if we didn't have the crane, we'd have to use your portable jacks, your locomotive jacks, up against the side of the car, but there's a couple of problems with that. The first problem is, I don't think this car has lifting points on the side. And even if it did, using jacks would mean we would need to keep the car level and lift the whole car off the trucks, off both trucks. So that would more than double our effort because we'd have to disconnect the other trucks also. And I'm not sure we could get the car high enough with the side jacks. The bottom end of this car has to be nearly six feet off the ground so the trucks will clear the crash bar under the coupling. Plus, lifting just this into the car let us focus and concentrate on just this truck. So I'm really glad we didn't have to use lifting trucks and had that 45-ton gantry crane. So at this point, everything's disconnected. The cribbing was in place. We had a tow cable attached to the trucks to pull them out. There was a hard set on the brakes, and the wheels were chalked on the B end. We'd gone over the lifting sequence a number of times so everybody knew what the plan was and what their job was. My niece, Caitlin, was manning the crane. We installed a sling under the coupling, which is going to be the only lifting point. Now here we can see the coupling from under the car with the wheels out of the way, and I know I'm jumping ahead a bit because the truck's already out in this photograph, but it's worth seeing the coupling, the yoke, and the draft gear. And you can see the crash bar hanging down, which is what has to be high enough to get the trucks out. So the slings on the coupling, the coupling's lifted against the frame, and then the yoke into the coupling is being held in the draft gearbox. Well, I think this is a good place to end this video. In the next video, we do the actual lift and move out the trucks. And then in that one, we'll look at the hardware in more detail. Then we swapped out the axle sets and we reinstalled the trucks. Now, I know this video is a break from our normal fare, but I hope you still found it interesting. And as always, this channel is not monetized, so it's entirely fueled by your comments, likes, and shares. Talk with you later. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.